Okay, so I'm delighted to ask Alex Komnenos to come up onto the stage. Alex is a long-standing colleague of mine. Um, he has been working for almost 10 years now in the field of kisspeptin. We know that there's been an explosion in our understanding of this amazing hormone. Uh, but you are now going to tell us a little bit more about how it interacts with human sexual behavior. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, and thank you to the Society for the honor to be invited to speak to you today about kisspeptin and reproductive behavior. Now, I think earlier today we've already had talks from the eminent Tony Plant and Manuel Tina Samper about kispeptin's effects on metabolism and puberty and reproductive hormone control. But I'd like to show you data today that suggests that kispeptin also has important roles in reproductive and emotional behavior. So I'll present data that I've collected over the last few years in the DILO lab, as well as data from other laboratories. So to start with, there is evidence that there are other factors involved in human male sexual behavior. So here is a study by Ramasamy and colleagues in Houston. There are two groups, testosterone replaced hypogonadal men and age matched controls. So as you can see here, the uh, hypogonadal men have lower pretreatment testosterone levels with associated lower psychosexual function. However, when this testosterone is replaced, their testosterone levels enter the normal range and their psychosexual function improves. However, it is still significantly lower than age match control. So this suggests that testosterone perhaps is unable to fully reverse psychosexual dysfunction and suggests the presence of other factors. Perhaps kispeptin is one of these missing factors. So as you're aware, kispeptin is a neuropeptide encoded by the KIS1 gene located on chromosome 1, and it acts on the kispeptin receptor encoded by the KIS1R gene on chromosome 19. So the first thing you're probably asking is, why is it called kispeptin? Well, Lee and colleagues, 21 years ago, first identified the KIS1 gene as an anti-metastatic gene at the University of Pennsylvania in the city of Hershey. Very beautiful campus, especially compared to where I work. Now, the city of Hershey is perhaps better known for its chocolate factory, as you can see here. And their most famous products are Hershey's Chocolate Kisses. So Lee and colleagues um, named their newly identified anti-metastatic gene, KISS-1, after Hershey's Chocolate Kisses. And interestingly, at that point, they had no idea that it was so heavily involved in reproduction and therefore so aptly named with the word KISS. So let's go back to the science and let's ask what is the significance of kispeptin in reproduction? Well, in 2003, two landmark studies first identified the crucial role of the kispeptin receptor in reproduction. So inactivating mutations result in hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism and therefore infertility. Since 2003, further studies have identified the inactivating mutations of the KISS1 gene as well as the receptor result in hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, and conversely, activating mutations result in central precocious puberty. So what happens when you administer kispeptin, so that's the KISS1 gene product, to healthy men? Well, Waljit Dillo pre performed the first kispeptin into man study just over a decade ago. And so here's a graph of LH against time. And you can appreciate the kispeptin infusion represented by that red line resulting in a robust increase in LH secretion compared to control saline. It's also been shown that this kispeptin-stimulated LH increase is abolished by pretreatment with a GnRH antagonist. And so this places kispeptin at the apex of the reproductive axis. So kispeptin is secreted by specialized KIS1 neurons within the hypothalamus and stimulates kispeptin receptors upon GnRH neurons, resulting in downstream stimulatory effects on reproductive hormone secretion. Now, this action of kispeptin in the hypothalamus covers just a tiny area of the brain. However, kispeptin and its receptor are expressed in numerous other brain regions, yet there's a lack of data exploring their roles here. Indeed, since the identification of kispeptin's crucial role in reproduction 14 years ago, there have been over 1,000 publications in the field. But as you can see here, they've all focused on the key structures of the reproductive axis, namely the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the gonads. And by contrast, other areas have been somewhat neglected. So there is a need to address this so that we can develop our understanding of reproductive biology and so that we can develop kispeptin as a therapeutic for reproductive disorders. So, one area of particular interest is the limbic system seen here in green, which has well-established roles not only in emotional and social behavior, memory and olfaction, 
but also in reproductive hormone control and reproductive behavior. Now, the amygdala, which is a key limbic structure, can also communicate with the reproductive axis as it has neuroanatomical projections to key hypothalamic centers involved in reproduction. Furthermore, the amygdala has several known effects on the reproductive axis as exhibited by stimulating and lesioning studies. So, for example, electrical stimulation of the rodent amygdala can delay puberty and alter the LH surge, and conversely, lesioning of the amygdala can result in hypersexuality, as in Kluver-Busey syndrome. So the exact effects are dependent on the region of the amygdala affected. So we became further interested in the limbic system following the identification by a number of groups of both KISS-1 and its receptor expression in the limbic system of humans and rodents. So here you can see KISS-1 expression in key human limbic structures, including the amygdala, the cingulate, the globus pallidus, the hippocampus, the putamen, and the thalamus, with this amygdala expression replicated in rodent studies. Now, if we look at the receptor, you can see a similar pattern of expression in key human limbic structures, which is again replicated in rodent studies. So, based on these anatomical studies, we asked, does kispeptin potentially modulate amygdala brain activity? So to address this, we employed the novel neuroimaging technique of manganese-enhanced MRI using a dedicated rodent MRI scanner and manganese as our paramagnetic contrast agent. Now this technique takes advantage of the fact that voltage-gated calcium channels open during neuronal activation and manganese has a similar size and ionic charge to this calcium and so can also enter these activated neurons resulting in an increase in signal intensity in these areas. So for example, you select a region of interest as shown here in the triangle, you give manganese and more manganese will accumulate in the more activated neuronal areas resulting in an increase in signal intensity detected by your MRI. You can then plot the signal intensity against time, and this increases as more manganese ions accumulate until there's no further manganese available to accumulate. You can then measure the difference in the rate of this manganese accumulation between two interventions, A and B, as shown here. So following intervention B, you can see a faster and greater accumulation of manganese compared to intervention A, suggesting greater neuronal activation. So in our study, we performed a two-hour MRI scan. Following baseline acquisitions, we commenced an intravenous manganese infusion at the same time as administration of a single intraperitoneal kispeptin or vehicle bolus. We uh, took blood every half an hour or so for kispeptin and LH levels. And so let's look at the results, starting with the blood results. So here is a graph of circulating kispeptin levels against time and LH against time. So you can appreciate that kispeptin administration, represented by that black arrow, resulted in a robust increase in circulating kispeptin and LH during this experiment. Now moving on to the scanning results, we selected the right and the left amygdala as our three-dimensional regions of interest. So here is a graph of signal intensity against time for the right amygdala and the left amygdala following vehicle administration at that black arrow. Now, if we compare this to his peptid administration, you can appreciate there is a lower signal intensity against time, suggesting lower neuronal activity following um, um, his peptid administration. So this suggests that his peptid administration can modulate neuronal activity in the amygdala. So we then wondered, what's the functional significance of kispeptin's ability to modulate this amygdala activity? And so we ask our next question, does kispeptin signaling in the amygdala perhaps modulate gonadotrophin secretion? And we are grateful to our collaboration with Kevin O'Byrne, who helped us answer this question. So in the first experiment, we performed direct intra-amygdala administration of firstly kispeptin to look at the effects of kispeptin receptor activation purely in the amygdala. And then in a separate ex experiment, we directly injected a kispeptin antagonist into the amygdala, therefore blocking endogenous kispeptin signaling in the amygdala. So we, uh, we selected a uh, bilateral injection sites, as shown here in the yellow circles. These are the areas with the greatest density of kispeptin neurons in the medial uh, amygdala. So first experiment, kispeptin directly into the medial amygdala bilaterally, and we collected blood every five minutes from a jugular catheter for LH secretion and LH pulsatility. 
So here are the results, starting with the effects of vehicle administration. So the top graph is a representative example of one animal in the group. So you can appreciate vehicle administration at that black arrow had no effect on LH secretion. The lower graph is the mean area under curve for all animals in that group divided into time course. So you've got the white bar, that's a two-hour baseline period. The black bar is one hour post-infusion, and the gray bar is hours two to four post-infusion. So what happens when you administer kispeptin directly into the amygdala? Well, there is a trend towards an increase in LH. And if you administer a higher dose of kispeptin, you see even more LH secretion, suggesting a dose-dependent relationship. Now, what happens when you do the opposite? What happens when you administer a kispeptin antagonist, and so you block endogenous kispeptin signaling in the amygdala? So we did the same experiment doing that and measuring LH. And here you can see the results in that brown box. So it, it, uh, blocking amygdala kispeptin signaling resulted in a decrease in LH secretion. We then examined the time profiles from each of the animals to look at LH pulsatility. So here's a graph of LH pulse interval for each of those groups and you can see no effect of vehicle or kispeptin on LH pulsatility. However, blocking endogenous kispeptin signaling in the amygdala with a kispeptin antagonist increased pulse interval, suggesting a novel role for amygdala kispeptin signaling in pulse generation. So in the first study, we showed that direct kispeptin administration peripherally decreased amygdala neuronal activity with a simultaneous increase in LH. This was the first evidence that kispeptin signaling may influence limbic brain activity and suggests that kispeptin may modulate the effects of the amygdala on the reproductive axis. In the second part, we showed that direct intra-amygdala kispeptin administration stimulated LH secretion and conversely antagonist administration decreased both LH secretion and its pulsatility. So this was the first evidence that kispeptin signaling within the amygdala can influence both LH secretion and LH pulsatility. So this suggests that kispeptin signaling in the amygdala as part of the limbic system can therefore integrate reproductive hormones with brain activity. And so following on from the study, the next step was to ask, perhaps there's a functional link to reproductive behavior and emotions given the limbic system is so heavily involved in these. So we now moved into humans. So the next question was, can kispeptin modulate human brain activity and human emotions and human mood? So to answer this, we employed functional MRI in 29 healthy young men to compare the effects of kispeptin versus vehicle administration on human brain activity. Now essentially this technique relies on fluctuations in blood oxygen levels to identify activated brain areas and therefore produce a map of this brain activation. So based on the previous studies, we were particularly interested in the limbic system, and as I mentioned before, the limbic system has important roles in sexual behavior, bonding, as well as negative, happy, and fear emotions. We therefore used tasks to activate the limbic system based on these emotions and asked, does kispeptin alter limbic brain activity compared to vehicle? So we used an emotional picture task where the participants viewed validated themed images during their MRI designed to activate their limbic system so we could see if kispeptin modulated that response. So we used sexual images. I've had to pixelate, unfortunately, the example here. So you'll have to use your imagination. And we also used non-sexual couple bonding, negative and neutral images, all designed to activate the limbic system. Then in the faces picture task, the participants viewed faces in happy, fearful, and neutral poses, again designed to activate their limbic system so we could see if kispeptin modulates this brain activity. So here is the protocol. We recruited 29 healthy men. They had two study visits each. So following um, a baseline period, they were infused for 75 minutes with kispeptin or vehicle during their first infusion, and then the other infusion on their second visit. The order of the infusions was, was randomized, and of course, the participants were blinded as to the infusion identity. Blood was collected throughout for hormone levels, and participants completed psychometric questionnaires at baseline, and then again towards the end of the infusion period. fMRI scanning was carried out during the infusion period while performing those tasks I detailed earlier designed to activate their limbic system. So that's the emotional picture task and that faces picture task. Now, we also performed a resting state scan designed to assess underlying resting brain activity. So let's look at the results, starting with the hormonal data. So here's a graph of circulating kispeptin levels against time with the infusion, 
the MRI and the questionnaire time courses at the top. So you can see that administration of kispeptin represented by that red line resulted in a robust increase in circulating kispeptin reaching a steady state during the MRI and questionnaire time courses with a similar profile observed for LH. However, testosterone did not increase during this time course, which is consistent with the literature that it takes over 90 minutes for kispeptin to stimulate downstream testosterone in humans. So let's move on to the imaging data, starting with the responses, so the brain responses to sexual images. So here are some cuts through the brain, constructed using the collected data from all 29 participants. So areas that are red and yellow represent areas of significantly enhanced brain activity during kispeptid administration compared to vehicle administration on viewing sexual images. So you can see that kispeptin enhanced brain activity in areas corresponding to the putamen, the globus pallidus, the thalamus, the amygdala, and the posterior cingulate. Now, we also examined kispeptin's effects on a priori anatomically defined limbic regions of interest. So here is a graph of mean signal change for each of these regions. The red bars are their kispeptin visits, and the black bars are their vehicle visits. So you can see again, kispeptin enhanced limbic brain activity. Now, interestingly, kispeptin's effects on the amygdala were limited to the left-hand side, which is consistent with the literature that states a lateralization for amygdala um, activity in response to sexual arousal. So now we took our brain activity data and we tried to correlate it with our psychometric data. So the hippocampus is an important reward structure and we observed that participants who were less reward responsive as people had greater hippocampal enhancement by kispeptin on viewing sexual images. In addition, um, greater putamen enhancement by kispeptin predicted reduced sexual aversion, giving some functional relevance to the brain activity data. Now let's look at the responses to bonding images. Again, very similar. Kispeptin activated a range of limbic structures here, including the amygdala, the thalamus, the anterior and posterior cingulate, as well as the globus pallidus. And greater amygdala enhancement by kispeptin on viewing these bonding images predicted improvements in positive mood. So now let's have a look at the negative images. Now, kispeptin activated, well, enhanced brain activity in the medial frontal gyrus compared to vehicle on viewing negative images. Now, this is an important negative mood structure and expresses kispeptin receptors. And consistent with this, we observe that kispeptin reduced negative mood on our psychometric questionnaires. Now, interestingly, this is in keeping with a rodent study that shows that kispeptin exerts dose-dependent antidepressant-like effects in mice. So this is a study by Tanaka and colleagues in Hungary, and they used a forced swimming test to assess mood, and essentially they placed the mice in water, and more time spent climbing and swimming rather than immobile signifies less depression. So you can see on this graph, increasing doses of kispeptin administered centrally resulted in more time spent climbing and swimming rather than mobile, so less depression. Now, interestingly, this effect is also blocked by adrenergic and serotonergic antagonists, giving some possible insight into the mechanisms involved. Now, let's look at these sexual effects in a tiny bit more detail with a recent rodent study from Kevin O'Byrne's lab. So here we show that, well, Kevin O'Byrne shows that direct kiss, uh, kispeptin administration into the amygdala can trigger erections in rats. So here is a graph of number of erections for each of these treatment groups, and you can see that kispeptin administration directly into the amygdala triggers multiple erections. In effect, it's reduced if you co-administer a kispeptin antagonist. So that's very interesting. Now, olfaction is another key reproductive um, behavioral component. Recent work from Ludwig's lab has identified an anatomical network comprising the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and the accessory olfactory bulb, all interconnected by kispeptin neurons. Now, interestingly, these amygdala kispeptin neurons receive vasopressinergic and dopaminergic inputs, suggesting further interplay with other key behavioral neuropeptides. Now, functional relevance for this network comes from a few studies. So here's a study by Kaufman in San Diego. There's preference index on the y-axis, and you can see wild-type males and KIS1R, so that's kispeptin receptor knockout males, who have been replaced with testosterone. So you can see a wild-type male prefers to sniff the females. However, if you knock out their kispeptin receptor, 
They have no olfactory partner preference, and this is despite being able to smell normally, so despite normosmia. Another study looks at the effects of urinary odors on kispeptin neuronal activity. So here's some work by Julie Backer, and this is a graph of percent activated kispeptin urines in the hypothalamus for female and male wild-type mice when they smell water or when they smell gender-specific urine. So you can see that females smelling male urine have increased activation of their kispeptin urines in the hypothalamus and vice versa. Now, functional relevance for this comes from a recent study by Watanabe and colleagues who showed that this enhancement of activity in the hypothalamus in response to this male urine results in enhanced LH surge. So, overall conclusion. So our own data and others' data putting this all together suggests that kispeptin signaling in the resting state, limbic, and olfactory networks can therefore integrate reproductive hormones with brain activity together with reproductive behavior and emotions and particularly the positive aspects of these. So looking to the future, I think it will be interesting to explore the neural circuits involved using animal models, and it will be also interesting to investigate the kispeptin limbic system in women to see if there's any sexual dimorphism. <clears throat> it will also be interesting to examine the effects of kispeptin on other limbic functions like motivation, and all of this with the ultimate aim of identifying clinical applications for kispeptin therapeutics to aid patients with associated disorders. Finally, I would like to thank in particular Waljit Dillo, whose lab I joined eight years ago and who has supported me throughout and shares my enthusiasm for this field of kispeptin research. I would like to thank all members of his lab, as well as Professors Miran, Blue, Matthews, and the late Mohammed Getai for their support and guidance throughout. I would like to thank the collaborators, Jimmy Bell and Kevin O'Byrne, who helped kickstart a lot of this early work. I'd also like to thank Matt Ward and Lysia Dimitriou for their help with the imaging components. I'd also like to thank the study participants for their time and trust and the funding bodies, and also here my two-month-old son, who has kept me highly entertained over the last few weeks. Thank you very much.